Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we will be analyzing a song of Faith Forsworn by John Warren. An interesting thing about this poem is that despite the poet being a man, the persona is a woman, which is why you should never confuse the two. This video is divided into four parts. Title analysis, reading the poem, analyzing the poem stanza by stanza, and looking at a few other things. Something that makes these video lectures more interesting is when I bring your attention to different details and make you question their significance to the poem by giving you some hints and sometimes I myself don't know what the persona is saying or what the poet attempts to highlight and you may crack the code without my help. So I'll be doing a bit of that here and there to ensure your minds actively participate in piecing the puzzle. Let's begin with analyzing the title. A Song of Faith Forsworn The title has a tone of defeat, as if this, as someone has tried to have faith but finally given up after a fight. The fricative brings a slight harshness to the tone, indicating you won't be finding anything positive in the poem. Now let's read the poem to find out if what we're saying makes sense or not. Take back your suit. It came when I was weary and distraught with hunger. Could I guess the fruit you brought? I ate in near desire of any food, nibbled its edge and nowhere found it good. Take back your suit. Take back your love. It is a bird poached from my neighbor's wood. Its wings are wet with tears, its beak with blood. Tis a strange fowl with feathers like a crow. That's a raven, it may be, for all we know. Take back your love. Take back your gifts. False is the hand that gave them and the mind that planned them. As a hawk spread in the wind, to poise and snatch the trembling mouse below. To ruin what it dares and then to go, take back your gifts. Take back your vows. Everything you trimmed and taught these lamps to burn. You bring them stale and dim to serve my turn. You lit those candles on another shrine. Guttered and cold, you offered them on mine. Take back your vows. Take back your words. What is your love? Leaves on a woodland plain. Where some are running and where some remain, what is your faith? Straws on a mountain height, dancing like demons all well pergus night. Take back your words. Take back your lies. Have them again, they wore a rainbow face, hollow with sin and leprous with disgrace. Their tongue was like mellow turret bell to toll hearts burning into wide-lipped hell. Take back your lies. Take back your kiss. Shall I be meek and lend my lips again to let this adder daub them with his sting? Shall I turn teeth to answer when I hate you kiss like Judas on a garden gate? Take back your kiss. Take back delight, a paper boat launched on a heavy pool to please a child and folded by a fool. The wild elm roared, it sailed a yard or more. Out went our ship but never came to shore. Take back delight. Take back your wreath, has it done service on a fairer brow? Fresh was it folded round her bosom snow? Her cast of weed my breast will never wear. Your word is love me, my reply, despair. Take back your wreath. Now that we're done reading the poem, let's analyze it stanza by stanza. Take back your suit. It came when I was weary and distraught with hunger. Could I guess the fruit you brought? The suit mentioned in the stanza is most likely a courtship or a marriage proposal which the persona readily accepts for she was at the lowest point in life, as suggested by weary and distraught. The hunger could symbolize her desperation, which led to her helplessness and vulnerability, encouraging her to take the fruit offered to her by the beloved. Since we see the mention of a biblical image later on in the poem, we may link the fruit to the forbidden fruit, which led to the ruination of Adam and Eve. I ate in mere desire of any food, I nibbled its edge and nowhere found it good. Take back your suit. The persona creates a contradiction. 
First, she says ate it, then she says she nibbled it. Nibble could signify the cautious nature of the persona, but the statement that she ate it says otherwise. It may be possible the persona attempts to explain she did not test things out at the beginning of the relationship. Out of desperation, she took all that she could, and after doing that, there was no way back, and she did the first thing one does when they encounter something new. She inspects it. Another thing to note is that the persona eats it due to desire and not need, highlighting her irrationality stemmed by her fear of living and dying alone, ultimately causing her own downfall. Take back your love, it is a bird poached from my neighbor's wood. Its wings are wet with tears, its beak with blood. Tis a strange fowl with feathers like a crow. We come across the first violent image in the poem. The entire image created is embedded with brutality. The beloved love is initially shown as a dying bird, and we are made to pity the unjustified tragedy that has befallen it. Then we see the prey transforming into the predator, encapsulating the concept of the Trojan horse. Now my question to you is, why are the bird's wings covered with tears and the beak with blood? Shouldn't it be the opposite? Tell me why you think that is so. Another thing to question is the persona's use of the pun on fowl. The adjective strange used for the fowl's description may suggest the persona is inexperienced, which comes with a large number of possible outcomes, including the worst. The plosive sound created by beak and blood may signify the persona's bitterness towards her naivety. A full stop follows this alliteration, allowing the sense of disgust to prevail for a longer period. Raven's death, it may be, for all we know. Take back your love. The phrase Raven's death may reflect on the possibility the persona's relationship with the beloved was bound to result in a tragic disaster signifying the toxic aspect of love and its destructive nature. The pauses before and after, it may be, may emphasize her uncertainty. Is she doubting herself, pondering over her character flaws that might have played a role in this tragedy? Another interesting thing to notice is that the persona says all we know. Who is the third person in the room? The only third person I can see is the reader. So while the persona narrates her heart-wrenching tale, is she simultaneously indoctrinating the reader to side with her without listening to the other side of the tale? Take back your gifts. False is the hand that gave them and the mind that planned them as a hawk spread in the wind to poise and snatch the trembling mouse below. Gifts may have the connotations appreciation, materialism, deception, bribery, and appearances. So getting gift would go either ways. The theme of deception is repeated as the persona describes the beloved's hand to be false, but we see the intelligence of the beloved as well in this stanza. He planned gifts, underlining his calculated traps, and thus contrasting the beloved's rationality and the persona's irrationality. The persona equates herself to a mouse, prey to the hawk, and an easy target as it is insignificant in the eyes of a larger creature. The persona may be stating she was an easy target for manipulation due to her naivety and innocence. One of the attributes the hawk possesses is poise, reflecting its speech, precision, and nature to stalk and learn about the prey before attacking symbolizing the beloved strategic manner of carrying out tasks with an inclination towards bribery and manipulation. The word below may indicate class differences and the persona frames herself as an inferior to the beloved. It may be her lack of understanding of the functioning of the society she is suddenly subjected to that results in her relationship with the beloved taking such a toll on her. To ruin where it dares and then to go. Take back your gifts. The phrase ruin where it dares may show the hawk did not attack the mouse out of hunger. You are not told what the, the hawk eats the mouse. It ruins it, hinting towards a more sinister side of human nature driven by desire. Moreover, the pause after dares may indicate the hawk tortures the mouse and carries on with its life free from consequences. Take back your vows. 
Elsewhere you trimmed and taught these lamps to burn. You bring them stale and dim to serve my turn. How can you take back your vows? You break vows and promises. So an image of a broken glass is thus created through this command. We can picture the persona towering over the beloved as he crouches to the ground and cuts his hands in the process of picking up the shards of glass. Another meaning of trim is to decorate, so over here the persona could be saying that initially the beloved did spend time and effort to please her through gifts and other appearances, but now he has stopped doing that as well, contributing nothing substantial to the relationship. The burning lamps could symbolize the persona's anguish. She might feel he is burning her through this lack of affection and his mistreatment towards her for the sake of his entertainment and the pursuit of raising himself to a higher standard than the personas in the eyes of others. The phrase, bring them stale and dim, could suggest the beloved limits the persona's horizon of possibilities, ensuring she is unable to escape the pain he puts her through. You lit those candles on another shrine, gutters and cold you offer them on mine. Take back your vows. The shrine imagery equates the human body to a shrine. The theme of infidelity is prevalent through the phrase another shrine, highlighting how disgusted the persona is by the beloved's outrageous behavior. Through the description of the candles being guttered and cold, emphasis is laid on the beloved's audacity for he exploits the persona to the very core elements of their relationship. Take back your words. What is your love? Leaves on a woodland plain, where some are running and where some remain. Words can have the connotations expression, deception, display, and illustration. The persona equates the beloved's words to leaves, some running and some remain, indicating the temporal nature of these words. The running words may be the positive ones and the words that remain could be negative. Remain could also suggest that there are certain words that will always stay with the persona and haunt her due to a dreading quality they possess, an underlying layer of threat perhaps. What is your faith? Straws on a mountain height. Dancing like demons on Valpurgis night, take back your words. The persona asks two questions, creating a sarcastic tone, making them seem accusatory. Through this stanza, the persona mocks the beloved speech, littered with words like love and faith, perhaps silently informing the reader he was verbally abusive towards her, and then made it up by telling her he loves her and that she should have faith in him. The evil nature of these words is exploited through vile, uncivilized imagery shown through dancing like demons. Straws on a mountain height could highlight the hollow and unsubstantial characteristics of the words which appear grand to the eyes of any other. The verbal abuse theory can further be supported by a hellish imagery of Valpurgis Night, providing a sinister and animalistic tone. Take back your lies. Have them again. They wore a rainbow face, hollow with sin and leprous with disgrace. Their tongue was like a mellow turret bell to toll hearts burning into wide-lipped hell. Take back your lies. Through have them again, the persona is suggesting the beloved to use his lies on someone else for she is now familiarized with his deceptive schemes. She compares their appearances to rainbows which are a natural wonder and symbolize peace and purity as they are refractions of light highlighting the beloved's mastery over the art of deception. It's interesting that the persona says his lies are hollow with sin. Shouldn't they be full of sin? Does sin constitute as vacuum? Is it antimatter? I wouldn't advise you to be sciencey in your analysis, but do wonder and comment your theories on why she says hollow with and not full of or packed with. Leprous with disgrace is a very agonizing and haunting image that will remain in the minds of readers, instilling fear in their souls of the horrendous damage caused by falling for lies. One thing to question is that the persona shows the beloved's lies as disgraceful, but does she herself feel disgraced to have fallen victim to them? Anyway, the religious imagery returns with mellow turret bell. 
that violence is once more echoed through the juxtaposition of mellow with burning and hell. The use of the adverb toll may hint towards a sinister thought that the abuse of the relationship may be physical as well as verbal, and perhaps that is why the persona uses religious imagery to symbolize the extremity of the relationship. Take back your kiss. Shall I be meek and lend my lips again to let this adder daub them with his stain? Shall I turn cheek to answer when I hate? A kiss may have the connotations safety, intimacy, passion, and affection. The persona's innocence is contrasted to the beloved's adder-like ways. Through his vile nature, the beloved takes advantage of and violates the persona's innocence. Shall I turn cheek to answer when I hate? It may show the persona's consideration towards resistance. She explores the relationship further through religious imagery, for it seems to be close to her heart. You kiss like Judas in the garden gate. Take back your kiss. She equates the beloved to Judas and herself to Jesus, representing the reader with the idea she is forgiving and her forgiveness and piety are taken advantage of. The alliteration in Garden Gate gives a sense she is choking on his lies and kisses. Take back delight. A paper boat launched on a heaving pool to please a child and folded by a fool. The wild M roared it sailed a yard or more. Note, the persona does not say take back your delight. She says take back delight, which may act as an insight to this aspect of their relationship which we assume to be mutual, making it extremely problematic for mutual desire despite the horrors of the relationship is the perfect ingredient for a toxic romance. There may be a sense of guilt as well, which is why she does not use the word your. The delight is equated to a paper boat which may indicate the relationship was based on lust and there was no foundation to it, everything was on a surface level, hence it was bound to sink. The heaving pool signifies the potential for disaster the couple forgets when indulged in toxic passion. The persona uses a child to personify herself most likely due to her innocence and naivety. The beloved is symbolized by a fool, which may seem like an insult, but some centuries ago, fools were considered to be very intelligent people who were kept in aristocratic households to entertain their masters by outwitting them. So when she says she was folded by a fool, she could mean she was being toyed by the beloved who was far superior to her in intellect, taking us back to the stanza relating to words. Wisdom gives you the skill to manipulate language to your advantage and give the ability to see beyond words and appearances and change others' perceptions. The word roared once again highlights violence, but this time the victim is not the persona but the pleasure of the unbalanced relationship which has led to the demise of delight. The phrase it sailed brings a sense of hope and, if that was the end of the poem, of eternity. This is shattered by the use of the dash, making the boat stop abruptly. The dash could mean the persona does not want to ponder over this thought. It could show that there was a chance of the relationship to improve, but this was taken away by some event. Thus, it was only able to sail for a yard or more. Out went our ship, but never came to shore. Take back delight. The boat is turned into our ship. This may show that it was full of potential, there were chances of a better future, but it never came to shore, showing they all died due to the beloved's mistreatment of the persona. Take back your wreath. Has it done service on a fairer brow? Fresh was it folded round her bosom snow. Her cast of weed my breast will never wear. Wreath reflects a person's promise to cherish their lover for eternity, but the persona is not given a wreath. She is given a cast of weed, making it obvious the symbolism is a mockery. The beloved is shown to chase appearances rather than characters, as you see him entertaining someone with a fairer brow. The phrase, her bosom snow, may reflect this person is cold and perhaps does not have emotional depths. Your word is love me, my reply, despair. Take back your beat. So when the beloved asks the persona to love me, her reply is despair. 
We are told she is exasperated by the beloved's ways, emphasized by the exclamation mark. Even if he wants to give the relationship another go, she is not ready to give another chance to the cheater. She prefers her suffering in despair rather than living once more with an unfaithful person who is bound to betray her. Now this concludes my stanza by stanza analysis. Now we will be looking at the things the persona asked the beloved to take back and their order of appearance. First comes suit, then love, then gifts, vows, lies, kiss, delight, wreath. The relationship appears to have been formed through a courtship, followed by love, then gifts. So it's not like the beloved bribed her into loving him. He invited her to converse and see their compatibility with one another. The beloved's confession of love may have led the persona to fantasize about the future of the relationship. And the beloved used this to his advantage by bringing gifts, giving way to naive wishful thinking. The vows that come after trap the persona who is lied to and kissed to bring temporary delight. The wreath shows the impossibility of the relationship to be eternal as it is used ironically. There are commas after love and delight unlike the other nouns which are followed by periods which may show that the persona is ready to reconsider these two things. Throughout the poem, the persona tells the beloved to take back and doesn't give these things to him herself, which may symbolize her strength for she no longer has a submissive attitude towards the beloved. Next thing to question is, why did a man write this poem? He may be highlighting the social evils, showing the status of women at the time, the power dynamics in the relationship, Perhaps this is a poem written out of guilt. It could be an apology. He could have witnessed this happening to a loved one. He could be acting as a voice for females. A number of things may have motivated him to write this. With that said and done, this is the end of the analysis. I've left tips on how to use this analysis to your advantage and further develop your theories and ideas. I'd love to read your analysis or interpretations of this poem and tell you what I think of them, so don't hesitate to leave a comment below. Do leave a like and subscribe, it helps more than you think. Take care. Bye.